the glass that goes in through these recycling systems, it's the waste glass that's used for, for glass making. It, it, it's, it's called Cullet. Hmm. C U L L E T. Huh. That's what you call it. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Four Top. It's a roundtable discussion of today's hot button topics in the wine and food world. I am your host, Catherine Cole. And I am Martin Reyes, Master of Wine, co-host. And Martin, I think we're going to discuss one of your favorite topics today, wine packaging. Now, how are we going to keep our listeners on board with this? I mean, we're going to talk about glass and cardboard for 45 minutes, so we're going to have to make it pretty interesting. Yeah, other than saying things like, hey, I like your packaging. Um, you know, most of the carbon footprint, the GHG greenhouse gas emissions of the wine trade lies in the package and the distribution and the transport of that package more so than, than what happens in the vineyard. Yeah, that's such an important point. And we've said this before on the podcast, but so much of the sustainability conversation about wine is about fine growing and it really should not be. I mean, of course that's important, but yeah we're coming to terms with just how multifaceted the decisions are that a producer and that producer's partner in the supply chain and the restaurateur, the retailer, those decisions have impact. I will confess that I think the, the new level of challenge of thinking about your packaging, it, it is daunting it, because there's so many variables that, that have to be weighed because everything's so interconnected. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so glad we have two world-renowned experts on the subject to talk us through this. Yeah, you know, our first guest, Melissa Saunders, she is a friend, but also a master of wine. And she wrote her, her thesis, her research paper on the subject of sustainable wine packaging. She's the founder of Commun Communal Brands, a wine import and distribution company focusing on producers committed to environmentally responsible practices and she also runs a consulting firm focusing on sustainable wine packaging and she's the director she's the wine director at the good goods a reusable wine bottle startup doing some really leading edge things in the wine trade for our future our circular economy we have such busy and inspiring guests. They're all doing a million things. And that also includes our other guest, Diana snowden Sess. She's the enologist at Domaine du Jacques in Burgundy. She, she's a consultant at Domaine de Trienne in Provence. And, oh, I think if you're a rosé lover like I am, you know that's that's like such a go-to yep. bottle of rosé. She's also the winemaker at Snowden Vineyards uh, in the Napa Valley, as well as for Ashes and Diamonds also in the Napa Valley. She is also a recognized authority on climate change as it relates to wine, and she holds a seat on Porto Protocol's Global Steering Committee. And I'm eager to hear these two chat because they have different points of view about packaging, um, and it, I think it'll be a really interesting conversation. Well, these past couple of years, wineries worldwide have been delayed in getting their products to customers due to glass bottle shortages. Let me say that another way. Due to supply chain issues, the wine industry is fully freaking out about glass right now, which makes us all wonder why we are even still using glass bottles, a technology that's thousands of years old. So let's kick off this conversation by maybe going around and listing all the things that are wrong with glass. Martine, maybe we can start with you. Why don't glass bottles make sense for wine. So let's get one thing straight, which we all recognize that there's many pros for glass, right? It is inert. Uh, there's zero oxygen transfer. It's, it stores great for years. In theory, it is endlessly recyclable, at least in theory. But right up front, a case of wine, 12 bottles, weighs around 36 to 40 pounds. You know how much of that actually is the liquid? How much? About 18 pounds. And it's absurd. And the, the heavier something is, the more the truck has to labor its way and the train and the plane and all, all the pallets and the boats have to labor through the supply chain. We should be angry at this. We should be mm -hmm. angry that our packaging makes up half of the weight of our product. If we just invent wine today, we wouldn't choose glass 
all the time. There are some instances in which you want to have something luxurious, or we don't want to geek out too much, but the actual production of that glass, if you've ever seen the, the factories and you see how it's made, they look like molten lava, they look like uh, Mordor, like the, the Mount Doom, there's just all of this molten glass, quartz, silica, all this stuff. There is a huge amount of, of energy just to actually create the glass. So there's like a double whammy. And if you end up extending out an, an, an analysis of what a traditional winery from start to finish, uh, its impact on the environment through greenhouse gas emissions, surprisingly, it's most of it, it comes down to the packaging and distribution. And that is a shocker to the trade. And one of the hotspots that we've all identified after a little bit of introspection and analysis and after the past two years where the conversation is the forefront of many of us in the wine industry, Glass is a huge hotspot for us to address. How? That's what the session is about today. Yeah, and, and, and producing glass, it's a toxic uh, process, isn't it? Maybe our guests can speak to that. Melissa? Sure. So, Martin, you raised a number of really great points in your introduction. Um, the problems associated with glass in the present day cannot be underestimated. One of them being the energy intensity of production, but also, sure, the negative impact of the emissions that occur throughout that production from a chemical standpoint, in addition to uh, issues with respect to carbon emissions, um, are also uh, relevant. Um, Martin, you were bringing up some examples. Having driven by glass production facilities myself, I'm reminded of like the Lorax, right? Like there's just yeah. all sorts of things happening um, that you kind of don't want in your backyard. That being said, it is really, really interesting to me that glass continues to have the foothold that it does, given at least what I know about glass. I think one of the problems that we face as an industry is lack of education around the negative impact of glass on the environment, and also the positive impact that could be had from alternatives. We are a very traditional industry. We are uh, really heavily rooted in it to the point where changes in mindset can be a bit like glaciers moving, pushing a rock uphill, you know, take your pick of, of challenges. But like any changes in mindset in society or in terms of human behavior, education is the first step towards driving some of that change to some more viable, less carbon intensive alternative. Thinking about what you just mentioned, Martine, the one thing that always brings me back to glass is that one word, inert. Yeah. And that is big. You can't get around inert. You know, that's the sticking point for fine wine. And, you know, here I am today speaking to you from Burgundy and the idea of putting a red Burgundy, which really deserves 20 years of aging in its vessel, the idea of putting that into anything other than glass is just, it's just impossible for me. And as long as you have fine wine using glass and saying that it needs to use glass, well, any other producer making anything that might be consumed in the first year by association all of a sudden has put itself into a lesser category. And so there's this, there's this problem, this dual problem of, of consumer perception and the fact that glass really is the best receptacle for aging. And so it's, you know, it's, it's a really tricky thing to re-educate. And the way I think I would begin is to do more of like the 101 on climate change. The fact is, is that we have more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere than the planet has seen in 3 million years. And we're really coming up against a wall. And so we are going to have to question the things that we hold dear in a way we never thought we would have to even 10 years ago. And and so that's, that's what opens up the discussion about alternative packaging and being really honest about whether or not your wine is going to be consumed within the first year. And, and I'm sure some of you know the statistics. It's, I, I, I don't know the exact number myself, but most wine is drunk within the first year of being produced. And Melissa, do you know the number there? A specific statistic I don't have handy, but I can tell you that it's pretty much all of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah, our whole industry is being is being driven by this tiny fraction of wine. 
and the perception of this tiny fraction of wine. So yeah, that is where you get into the education of, of really associating an alternative packaging with true sustainability. And, um, and that's what we have to make chic. So this, this is really interesting because um, I think about like the supply chain issues we've been having these last couple of years. And I almost wonder, I hate, I'm not like a pro-capitalist person, but I almost wonder if like Adam Smith's invisible hand is going to force change. Like you're saying, Diana, I mean, those of us who can afford more expensive wines, maybe those are the ones that are going to stay in the bottle. And I wonder if you all are noticing with supply chain issues, is glass going to become so expensive that, that, you know, regular grocery store everyday wines won't be economically feasible for them to be in glass anymore? Ah, fair enough. That's a great question. And a, a great way to segue to something that I, I, I wanted to make sure that came out in the very beginning of our conversation. Conversation. Yes, the cost of glass is skyrocketed. All four of us really on this panel have produced or are producing wine. So we are fine-tuned to understand that we're looking at over a dollar as now standard for luxury glass and sometimes even more with all the, the tariffs and the, and the surcharges of fuel. So kind of like gasoline, which is also sk skyrocketed, we're now asking ourselves, do we need to always have a uh, combustible engine as our main source of transportation, do we always need to have glass as the predominant vessel for our wine? I've heard a few podcasts and climate talks, especially with Porter Protocol over the couple of years where the alternative packaging person and the glass recycled return and reuse person, they got into a heated argument about which one was better. Because on the one hand, you had lighter recyclable and less carbon intensive. And the other hand, you had this inert, as, as Diane said, perfectly uh, built a vessel that is still unmatched for wine. And I think that we must pause and say, wine isn't the same to everybody. The barefoot wine that is consumed in me almost within hours of being purchased or Yellowtail or the, or the Almaden or whatever, that is a very different thing. It's a, it's a beverage. It's a libation that is intended to do very sim a very simple pleasure at the poolside, and there's nothing wrong with that. And that's that's where the, the opportunities are to find alternatives for the heavy glass, which is never going to go away, nor should ever go away for those moments in that channel of that wine, which is fine, intended to age, has a very unique um, application to it, which is what culturally we think of when we think of wine. But it isn't the majority. If you're used to buying $20 or higher, we are 10%, maybe 12%, 15 max of the entire industry. The average bottle price in the US has historically been under $10. The average price, 80% probably can use and can benefit from looking at alternatives that Melissa has, is well versed in. And the other 10% can and should be protected with the glass bottle, which is never going to go away as those that um, you know, Diana makes as well, a fantastic producer, both in Burgundy and in Napa. You've triggered something in me. So uh -oh. by bringing up Yellowtail and Barefoot, yeah, you've hit a little bit of a nerve because one of the challenges that I face as someone that's trying to produce what I would consider to be fine wine, albeit mm -hmm. not, you know, excruciatingly expensive, but fine nonetheless, in terms of how it's farmed, by whom, how it's produced, you know, smaller farmers, et cetera. Fine wine. The problem that I have using the barefoot and yellowtail analogy is that when I put these fine wines in bag and box, I have the challenge that there's an expectation that wine in bag and box is only cheap wine and that it is only really suitable for the yellowtail barefoot style market. I'm putting that out there because what I'm trying to do is create acceptance and a market for wine and bag and box that is for that middle tier for wines that, although might sit at less than $20 on a retail shelf for a 750 milliliter equivalent bottle, you know, they're between that 15 and $20 range. They're not sub 10. And that's the majority of what most people consume. And if you're, I guess, a somewhat savvy consumer, you know that some of the best values, the highest quality can be found in that zone. And there's no reason that wine that's in that sort of middle tier, you know, should not be 
acceptable for the bag and box format. It's it's a myth that bag and box has to be cheap and crappy. That said, if more wine that was in the sub $10 range was in bag and box and people were more comfortable drinking that format, you could have real impact because that's where the volume is. And at the end of the day, I really want impact. But I think that what's what's interesting to me is that in order to uh, demystify this improper myth about this packaging type, you need to be putting wine in it that actually has credibility and educating about the fact that you shouldn't feel shame about it. It's so interesting. I, I, I admittedly have a ton of stuff shipped to me um, because of the convenience that it brings. If something comes to me and has a peanut in it, I'm like fucking done. I'm done. Those styrofoam peanuts. I mean, come on, <laughs> come on. Yes. You know, yeah. it's like, really? But we're okay with glass. It's almost because of the poor state of the recycling industry in our country. It's almost as bad as a peanut. And we need to start feeling shame about that rather than feeling shame about the fact that we're squeezing wine out of a bag. I stand uh, with you in solidarity. An incomplete answer that I gave, I was looking at, um, unfortunately, the two extremes. And you're absolutely right, Melissa. 100% agree with you with everything you said. Diana, do you want to have any, add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, the whole conversation is really complicated and layered. I also make wine from Provence, Domaine de Trienne. All of the wines are under $20. They're over 10 under 20 And we use bag and box for the European market. Our bag and box supplier, and Melissa and I have talked about this, and she has a better supplier, and I should tra track down her supplier. But our supplier guarantees two months of a shelf life. So that's just not enough to get from Provence to the United States. So bag and box is just in Europe. We also use uh, key cakes, and that has a longer shelf life. Uh, on the other hand, plastics are a whole nother conversation. They just simply aren't recyclable. And um, we're seeing a lot of news right now about the lawsuit that California is taking out against Exxon because of all of the marketing campaigns to make plastics look recyclable when in fact they just aren't and they end up in the oceans. If, if we aren't done in by our carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions, microplastics will be the end of humanity. You know, when you look at sustainability, you can't just look from the, the angle of greenhouse gas emissions because then you're, you're polluting essentially. Uh, you have to look into all of these very different criteria from microplastics to use of water to uh, exploiting minerals and and it's this you know multi-dimensional equation that's really hard to nail down. Diana, can I back you up and ask you? You mentioned key kegs. What are those? So key kegs are single-use plastic kegs, and the advantage of a key keg is once again going back to the volume of liquid per um, receptacle. You're moving a lot of wine with very little weight and packaging, so that has a huge benefit in terms of your carbon emissions. On the other hand. It is a giant lump of plastic and plastic is not recyclable. So it's like this trade-off. And we are, we are using it because it does lower greenhouse gas emissions and restaurants love it. And it's very convenient. But I feel, you know, I feel torn about it because microplastics are a huge problem. And then, and then we still are using bottles and we're using the lightest bottles that you can find. They're, I think, 400 grams. And at 400 grams, a bottle is actually pretty cheap. So that's, that's great. But let me tell you, when you show up to a party with, you know, with a Jarro of rosé versus a, versus a bag and box and rosé, the reaction's not the same. And somehow we need to make that cool. And, and I am ready to, you know, come rolling up with my bag and box because, you know, there's a huge difference in terms of carbon emissions between a Jeroboam of glass and a bag and box. And it's the same three liters. Okay, this is fantastic, and I, I agree. I can. I love that party image, uh, Diana. So it's, it's fantastic. Um, so, M Melissa, I wanted to expand a little bit about uh, since we're talking about bag and box. You've written extensively on this subject as well. In fact, your Master of Wine research paper touched on significantly the perceptions, right, of the retailers and the educators and the gatekeepers and the consumers around alternative packaging and their understanding of the impact on sustainability 
in that. You, you, I mean, talk about nailing your academia to just jump right into the subject at the right perfect time. Can you talk a little bit about Bag and Box and some of the other formats we should know about? There's a lot to unpack here. Well, I'll start by saying that I, I have done extensive research on the topic, both market research with respect to trade perception of alternatives to glass, and also research with scientists on the environmental science behind the various packaging types and environmental impact. Oh my God, that's my cat. This is going to be a tough one. Okay. Your cat is it's welcome okay. to join. Okay. So um, <laughs> I chose bag and box as my preferred format because it has the lowest carbon footprint, hands down. And we touched on some of the reasons for that. Number one being less packaging waste in general. So I work with three liters. It's the equivalent of four 750 milliliter bottles of wine with one small unit, nice and compact. You uh, eliminate four bottles of glass, the labels, the capsules, et cetera. 75% of it is recycled cardboard. So off the bat, you're starting with just like one tiny thing. You've stripped out a tremendous amount of waste. Second thing is the, is the weight, about 40% less weight. My cases are six, three liter bag and box. That's the equivalent of you know 18 liters of wine or two cases of nine liters, standard cases, 40% less weight right there. And then another reason that Diana was referring to is the volume. So I'm shipping a lot more volume in a, in, in a lot less uh, packaging, essentially. So I've, I ch I've chosen the format for that reason, knowing that I have this perception I issue to change. Through my research, what I learned is probably what I didn't need to spend two years researching. And that is that, you know, perception rules glass is king. I'm going to say king. It's so terrible, but it is like kind of that, you know, good old boy network mindset that's, you know, holds on to history and tradition in a way that I think is getting a bit stale. And I think that despite the fact that most of the folks that I interacted with on this topic um, have a, a real care for being as sustainable as possible and want to do the right thing, there's uh, two things that are getting in the way of that. One is lack of education. Everyone thinks that recycling rules when it comes to being sustainable in terms of their behavior. And first of all, that's, that's not entirely true. And I can get into that if you'd like, not to mention the fact that, you know, roughly, you know, 70% of what we think is being recycled is actually going to landfill. And then the other very large impediment is that there's this perception issue at the consumer level that gets in the way. So despite the fact that we're all members of the trade and essentially are making taste to the extent that we want to, we also are waiting for consumers to demand things before we're willing to sometimes take a step. And I'm not saying this in a negative way. We're business people. There's, you know, there's risk associated with it. I completely understand. But in the end, a lot of the trade is waiting for consumers to be like, I want premium wine and bag and box before they're willing to take some of those steps. And um, I, I just don't think that that's going to happen. I think it's our job as industry professionals that have the ability to influence consumers to actually make it acceptable. You know, my job as a producer, as an importer distributor that is, um, you know, influential on distribution channels, and also as a master of wine that has a responsibility in the industry, I feel like I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and just keep doing it and educating in my small way probably improve my social media a little bit so I could be more effective and just, you know, make it happen. So hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. You, and you're definitely a, a leader in the three liter space. So I appreciate that. All you've done. <laughs> oh, I also wanted to say, and Diana, I think that my bib discussion or bag and box or bib is overshadowing reusable glass and I don't want it to single use glass is the problem. If you reuse glass, you're, 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 it's the best. It's better. It's, it's hands down the best option. The issue with that is it is highly, highly complicated. The circular economy and developing a circular economy for glass in our industry is not a quick process. It involves a number of different steps and a number of different changes 
to behavior, to infrastructure. It is really, really big. And bag and box is more instant gratification. But I think down the road, I would love to see us moving and continuing to move in the direction of a reusable economy for glass, for our industry in as many ways as we possibly can. It's just, we have to crawl before we walk. And Diana, you can probably speak to this, you know, the, the standardization issue, just even reverse logistics and the challenges with that. So it's, it's a lot. Can we really quickly explain, Melissa, a little more what you're talking about? You're talking about a glass bottle that is refilled and reused over and over. It's never put into the recycling bin. That's correct. So essentially the ask is that the, the, the glass that the consumer purchases with that wine in it, once they finish that bottle, that they don't put it in their recycling bin, that they actually hold on to it and return it uh, to a, a place that would accept returns. Or in certain instances, what, what we're working on with good goods right now is just make it available so that it can be picked up like the milkman. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, Diana, I, I hear that you are a big proponent of this idea of a universal wine bottle. So maybe you can tell us more about this idea, this concept. Yeah, thank you. No, I knew we would get here. So I was just patiently waiting. And I think, <laughs> I think actually, if you don't mind, I'm going to back up and just tell the story from my point of view from the beginning. Please, please. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I'm a winemaker, both in Burgundy and in California. And I have always been concerned about climate change, but it really only kind of hit home and fell on me like a ton of bricks over the 2017 vintage in Napa. And it was, you know, that was the first fire vintage. But before the fire vintage, we had this heat wave over Labor Day weekend where uh, the temperatures got up to 120 degrees. And I grew up in St. Helena and I grew up in the Napa Valley. We had never in my life seen temperatures like that before. And that's when I realized that really what I love, what I do may not be possible for the future generations. And I just, from that moment on, threw myself into studying climate change and how our industry could be powerful to, to decelerate it and raise awareness. And the elephant on the couch is absolutely glass bottles. And that's what we're talking about today. And, um, and so I, you know, there's, there's, is, there's a lot to way in terms of true sustainability and the life cycle analysis of a bag and box versus glass. But the fact remains that I make wine that really is in a category that has to be put in glass. And, and so, you know, I just considered that within my sphere of control, a limiting factor. And so I just came to the point where I realized, you know, if we're going to be giving things up and if we're going to hang on to what is truly necessary inert receptacle is, you know, it's, 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 you know, kind of the thing that you, you hang on to and other stuff you can let go of. And in order to make glass conform with the Paris agreement, which is to say to get our country, our businesses, our families, our households to zero emissions, well, then you have to embrace a zero waste approach to life in all things. And zero waste means you don't just use something once and throw it away. And we've spoken a little bit about recycling. The fact is recycling is a bit better because you're not completely losing that, that material. And, and the fact is, is that the world is running out of sand necessary to make glass. And that's another subject that people forget about. You know, we still have a few years be before us, but you can't make glass from desert sand. You have to use riverbed sand and there's less and less of that. So recycling might be an answer to that problem but it takes so much heat to melt glass anyway. And the recycling system is completely broken in the United States and it's, and it's better in Europe, but it's still not 100%. And really the best thing would be to reuse glass as the wine industry did not very long ago. And so the fact is, is that this is something that is easier in Europe because it is something that has been done historically and the infrastructure is still there. And um, I'm lucky enough to have a company just 10 kilometers away from my winery that has been washing glass continually uh, since the beginning of the company in 1945. And they wash hundreds of thousands of bottles a year, and those bottles are reused. And that is, as Melissa says, a really complicated infrastructure to put in place when it doesn't exist. But when there is already a beginning, uh, then that then it's just much easier to get it to take off. So I think 
yeah, that is where the, my focus will be is more in getting that infrastructure to, to tab lift off. And what will be necessary is not having, you know, thousands of different bottle shapes, because the problem is, is that in order to put it on a bottling line, you have to have a really standardized bottle height. And the bottling, you know, the wine world has standardized the size of a bottle opening because a cork is standard no matter where you are in the world. So the opening of a bottle is a standard diameter, standard length. All we need to do now is to standardize the bottle itself. And it sounds, it sounds um, like a huge undertaking. And people in my own industry say, you're crazy. And then I come back to them and say, don't you realize if we don't get to zero emissions, your children won't make wine. It will be over. Mm-hmm. I, am I am I actually crazy, or can we give up our you know our 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 individual bottle shapes and share a bottle? You know, Diana, when I think about this, one thing that gives me hope is not so long ago, shipping containers were all different sizes and shapes. And at some point, the entire industry said, wow, imagine if shipping containers were all the same size and shape and we could just stack them on trains and stack them on ships. And no matter what company owned the container, it was the same shape. At that time, I don't don't know exactly what year that was, but I do remember reading about it. Everyone was like, oh, there's no way we can do that. And, you know, now it's just a given. So I feel like there's hope. I I really, I believe that this is going to happen. And I, I'm so pleased that you are a driving force behind this. Yeah, Yeah, no, I, I agree. And there, there are more and more companies that are doing it and it really is already starting. And, um, I see it more as an opportunity because there are a lot of businesses that need to start existing, you know, places where you can accumulate dirty bottles and, and have them washed. And that's a whole business that is a service because not every producer has room for that. So I think that it's actually an opportunity in disguise and it's only a matter of time. You know, when people ask me what Oregon sparkling wines they should try, I always mention Grand Moraine. And I am such a sparkling wine freak that I wrote a whole book about it called Sparkling Wine Anytime. And in that book, I recommend Grand Moraine's Brut Rosé. So I am just tickled that Grand Moraine is sponsoring the Four Top this season. Winemaker Shane Moore's style is just super polished and elegant. His Brut Rosé offers up fresh raspberry and strawberry notes from the Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. Grand Moraine also produces a vintage Blanc de Blanc, available only at the winery or via the website. It spends five years en tirage and is just so stylish with notes of lemon curd and brioche. You've got to try these wines. Order some of that delicious bubbly at grandmarine.com. It's G-R-A-N-M-O-R-A-I-N-E.com. Use the promo code 4TOP for complimentary shipping. And while you're there on the Grand Marine website, reserve a tasting. Get on down to the wild western edge of the Yamhill Carlton Appalachian and sip some of that delicious bubbly at Grand Marine's beautiful open air winery. Thanks so much for sponsoring us, Grand Marine. There's always going to be a segment of the wine industry that's not going to change. It, just, it doesn't have any incentive. It doesn't have any belief, no, no sense of urgency or politically or otherwise, right? And then there's going to be that subset that says, ah, yes, Melissa is doing something brave. Diana is doing something brave. I want to join in that bravery. I want to either invest in the circular economy, circular wine economy, which right now is, is, doesn't exist, but it, it is going to exist. And the scale and the speed at which it's going to exist really depends on the brave people who are, or brave companies, or brave producers, or brave iconoclasts. And I have to jump in and say critics, you know, Jancis Robinson is including bottle weight in her reviews. um, And I I hope that other critics take up this practice as well. Yes, Robert Parker, wine advocate, the new leader there was one of the first, is I think the first to consider the sustainability chops, if you will, of of the wines that they are reviewing. The LCBO, the, the, this is on Ontario, the monopoly companies that buy for the whole province or the whole state or the whole country in like Sweden or something like that, they are instituting weight limits to their bottles at a certain price point. You're right, actually, Catherine. If there are enough commercial reasons <laughs> to say, okay, fine, I don't really believe in lightening my glass, but if I want to have a conquer a new market out there, fine, I'll do it. Yeah. And now we do have these supply chain issues. I keep mentioning where, you know, small producers are telling me I can't get my bottles. I can't get my bottles. And I say to them, imagine if there was just one universal bottle, then you could get it from any supplier. Right. You know, which is part of the problem also. I mean, um, 
historically bottle suppliers have been against this idea. It's not, you know, it's been a long time, a long discussed issue, but we have a major positive piece of news is that Veolia is coming out with a universal bottle. They're designing it now. So that's, that's a huge, huge uh, piece of the puzzle. And, and what's we'll Veolia? Make, Can you tell us? It's, it's just one of the big bottle supplying companies. It's one of the biggest in the world. And they're coming, you know, all bottles are washable, but they are embossing a special symbol on the bottle. So it, conveys to the consumer that it can be reused because you can't, you can't have different, as I said before, you can't have different sizes of bottles. So you need to have, so it gives the symbol so that the consumer and the bottle washer know that it is the same size and it will be standardized. And can we follow up on this idea of, of reusing these bottles? Melissa mentioned Good Goods, a company that she's involved with. with uh, Diana, I think you said you were as well. I think there's also a company called Conscious Container. Conscious Container is another one, yeah. What What do these companies do exactly? Logistically, like how do they gather the bottles and, and wash them? So Conscious Containers is a startup that's still raising money, and uh, they will be a washing service. And I believe that they uh, they do not collect bottles. That is a separate thing that has to be organized. Mm -hmm. The company that I have here in Burgundy does collect bottles from the winery. They even collect bottles as far as Belgium and Corsica, and they are shipping containers of empty, dirty bottles, washing them and, and then shipping them back, which of course has a carbon footprint. And ideally there would be washing stations closer to our viticultural areas and more of them. And you can also buy a small um, bottle washer. And there are companies that are doing that as well. And you can do it with your direct to consumer program where there's a bottle return uh, part of that also. And that is, I believe, what Good Goods is now doing right now. So maybe Melissa, you can tell us about Good Goods. Sure. Yeah. So Good Goods did start with the retail tier, meaning their initial focus was counting on that consumer, bringing that bottle back to the retail store so that enough glass could be returned so that it could be washed and reused. The sad reality uh, was that a lot of bottles were not actually coming back. They came back when there was a what I'll refer to as a very high level of engagement at the retailer. And uh, what I mean by that is the retailer was really, really into this and was educating that consumer and being very forthright about the environmental benefits and what needed to be done and such. And then bottles were, were actually being returned, but it was still a staggeringly low percentage relative to what we expected. So with that knowledge, uh, we revamp what we were doing and um, are focusing more on direct to consumer and wine clubs that are focused on, on zero waste. And so when the wine is delivered for the club, the wine bottles that are empty can be simultaneously picked up and returned so that they can be washed and reused. Another layer of complexity with this, although we're increasing our number of returns because essentially no one has to actually bring the bottle back and we're making it really easy, is the reverse logistics piece of this. What is reverse logistics? Well, uh, forward logistics, I guess we'll start there, is things being delivered to you. So UPS, FedEx, you know, you name it, they're bringing things to you. That is their job. There currently is no service where the forward piece of the logistics, the delivery, and the reverse piece of logistics, which is the pickup piece, are actually tied together. So currently, until now, and good goods, if a company, whether it's wine or groceries or any type of goods, was interested in participating in the circular economy and having their packaging be reused, they had to have the carrier drop it off and then a separate trip for a carrier to pick it up. This was not only economically unsustainable because you're basically paying for two trips and nobody wants to pay that much more to be sustainable, but it also, from an environmental perspective, just makes zero sense. So Good Goods is doing it. They're dropping off and they're picking up. So there's a logistics component to the business that when I initially came on board did not exist, but we saw this logistics piece as vital to any company actually having a, a viable shot in the reuse space. Um, it really came down to economics. So now not only is Good Goods delivering and picking up wine bottles, 
for wine clubs, but it's delivering and picking up a whole other slew of goods that the customer that's interested in being sustainable and participating in the circular economy could be ordering. And they're, they're handling the forward and reverse logistics. What are some of those other goods? Oh, it's um, some uh, grocery companies, so high-end olive oils and, you know, other, um, you know, sort of fancy food goods. It's very, 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 very interesting. Uh, I think the thing that's been most interesting to me, and circling back to what we spoke about earlier, is that there, there are so many layers to this that are absolutely surmountable, 100%, but it is, it's going to take time. It's, it really is. And it's it going to take a commitment now, you know, yesterday, really, you know, it isn't something that you can just turn a switch on and then all of a sudden it can happen at a, at a level and a scale that can have impact. But, you know, the sooner we raise awareness uh, about the problem, about um, what solutions are required. Um, I think, Diana, the fact that Gralia, the glass company is actually taking that step is a huge positive sign because they see the writing on the wall. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and in in the end, for most large companies that are, you know, deeply embedded in their industry, whatever it is. So if you're a glass producer, of course, you're going to be super freaked out. Your whole business depends on as many different shapes and sizes as possible. And, you know, you're probably like in cahoots with the bottling lines to ensure that, you know, I mean, it's just, it's a whole big web of a mess. And it is, you know, very, I guess, you know, capitalistically minded. Um, But I think what's, what's interesting to me is that hopefully with education, even the glass producers that, you know, have historically relied on a particular way of operating, will see that there could be a new way of operating that can be absolutely just as economically fruitful for them. And I often think, well, if I was a glass producer and I saw that you know, and I relied on variety of glass in the past so that I could make as much money. But now I'm seeing that the economy is going to be shoved in the direction of reuse. Well, maybe I'd consider charging for washing as, a, you know, there's a lot of creative ways that you can be entrepreneurial and, and just kind of see where things are going. I think that's exactly where that industry will go, Melissa. I think that bottle salespeople will also start washing. I mean, I think it just goes hand in hand if you're offering a reusable bottle. And you can, you can understand from what Melissa was talking about with the reverse logistics, if you have a bunch of different bottle shapes, some of which can be washed and some of which cannot, I mean, it's just, it's a fundamental problem. In order to get to bottle reuse, we have to limit bottle shape. And the other thing, the other piece of the puzzle is changing our labels. In the 80s, we moved from labels that have glue and they they come off pretty easily to the sticker auto adhesive labels, which stay on for a long time and they don't come off in champagne buckets, but they don't come off when you want to wash and reuse the bottle. And so um, one minor victory getting to our ultimate uh, destination uh, of bottle reuse for me this year was uh, I started a tiny, a tiny brand just to uh, essentially at the moment, at the time it was to work with good goods and Melissa, you and I should start that conversation again, (laughs) but I tracked down a auto adhesive label that is theoretically hydro soluble. So that's something that, um, that's something that we're going to see if it actually proves to work or not, but getting off the label is another big piece of the puzzle, which as Melissa says, not instrument mountable, but needs to be solved in order to get where we want to go. You know, as I'm listening to both of you back and forth, it's a, a brilliant conversation. It strikes me, and it's it's been that way for a while, I've thought, where from the perspective of the consumer, the idea of convenience has probably been, it might have been seen as one of the banes of sustainability. You know, mixing cardboard and plastic, packaging in such a way that that is makes it more difficult to recycle. There's m- many ways for us to to think creatively, as, as both of you have expanded upon, where you use the convenience for good. You, you know, we, if we have a standardized bottle across the board, think about how convenient that would be. If, if we make the, the reverse logistics easy for the consumer, that really, again, uses convenience to incentivize everybody to do the right thing. The the glass return and reuse horizon is probably closer than we think, but it's still in the future. 
we are running out of time on our episode, but I want to at least acknowledge to our listeners that other alternative packaging, like cans, of course, like mimic bottle mimickers, where it's not the glass, but it is a alternative material that still has a shape of glass, is lighter, it can still be, you know, put into your wine rack. There are probably articles that you can read about which one has the highest, lowest carbon footprint, which one stores wine over two months versus a year versus six months versus, you know, three or four years. There's a lot of that we probably won't get to that again, strikes at convenience and creativity, right? Which is, which is something that's present now. And I, I think I wanted to ask, um, uh, Diana, like, is there a space for you to consider some of these other alternative packages in the meantime? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've looked into some alternative bottles for the wine, uh, the the wine that is our kind of everyday uh, Napa cab wine, you know, and I was definitely keeping in mind a true life cycle analysis. As I mentioned before, I'm really against plastic. And it's, you know, the word inert is so loaded, I think it's important to actually take the time to explain the implications of being inert. The problem with plastic is not just because it is ha- reacts with the wine and is not inert with the wine, but when it gets into our ecosystems, it's a sticky molecule that picks up all of the terrible chemicals that are coming off of big ag, breaks into tiny little particles, gets into our bodies, and completely messes with our endocrine system. And it very likely is going to, it's, it's causing us as, uh, not just us, but uh, lots of animals um, to have hormor- hormonal imbalances that are making us sterile. So it's really not nothing. And I hate to like throw these things out. I'm the biggest bum out at a party. Um, but I, you know, part of this work is actually opening your eyes and your heart to where we are as a planet. It's really hard. It's really painful. It's really deeply upsetting. But I really wanted to take the time to bring that side of the conversation to light because plastic is terrible. And, you know, along with refined sugar and a lot of, you know, a lot of things that, uh, that humanity has, has created, it very might well be our demise. So I have eliminated plastic from the things that I would want to do with any of my wines. So I, I am still very interested in cakes and I kind of went down that rabbit hole and generating a growler program. Growler programs are when the consumer brings their own refillable glass recipient to a store and has it filled on site. And, um, you know, I should, I should say Jer- Charles Beeler, Gotham Project, has done so much on the return and reuse um, programs in wine. And he is a friend of mine and he shared his hard earned experience with growlers, which is that when it ends up in the hands of a store, um, that bottle is not being sparged with inert gas, which is something you have to do before you fill a recipient. And that means that it has a shelf life of like a week. And so without that added step, and that added step just feels like too much, you know, your wine in one week is all of a sudden not what it should be. And that's that's a real problem. So I have put a pause on, on uh, the growler idea. And the other thing I've looked into is some of these um, bottles that, uh, and you can see some of the startups on the Porto Protocol website, but these bottles made out of quote unquote biodegradable plant materials. They just aren't obtainable yet. They aren't available on the market. I have really tried to hunt them down and they aren't available. So that's where I am for Snowden. For Domaine Dujac, honestly, and I'm just going to be honest, I'm always going to use glass, but I am going to push hard with everything I have to, to wash that glass. Diana, I just want to say one quick thing, and I am by no means a scientist, and I am by no means an advocate for plastic, but I, and I appreciate everything that you said about the negative impact of plastic. I do want to make it clear, though, that not all plastics are created equal. It's a highly complex topic that we don't have time for today, but there is a spectrum. The plastic bag in bag and box is often something that I'm criticized about. And I think that um, I'm not gonna argue it's plastic. It's not recyclable because we don't recycle flexible plastic in the US and the fact that it has the tap on it as well and it has two different types of material makes it even more complicated. 
However, from an environmental standpoint, which would include environmental impact, but also I would like to thank health of the planet, um, it, there, it, everything needs to be looked at holistically and on balance. And it's not as evil as people think. That's my scientific answer. And as an example for that, I will say that I admire tremendously uh, the Nordic countries for their environmental behaviors. Um, and I will shout out to Sweden and the system Bolligate, which is the uh, monopoly that purchases for the entire country and their wine retail system, the system Bolligate, it is comprised of over 60% bag and box for the environmental impact. So I think that there's, of course, I'm not here championing plastic, but it's all there, there, there is a spectrum and it is all relative. And that should not be the reason that people dismiss the environmental benefit of three liter bag and box. So I just want to. Yeah, no, I agree, Melissa. I, I completely feel you. The, the fact is our existence is just, it can't be we always leave an imprint. There's just no way to get away from it completely. And we have to work with what we have right now. And, and I use bag and box, like I said, for, for Dimitrian, we use bag and box in, in Europe and we use a plastic key keg in the world. And because it, you know, it's, it's, it's an impossible equation. I am sitting here in France where all of our electricity or 60% of our electricity is powered by nuclear power plants. And I actually believe that nuclear power plants are probably the least of our problems right now. So it's, in, it's a very, complicated, impossible thing to get perfect. Yeah, this is such a tough issue, but I, I thank everyone for bringing their perspectives. It sounds like there are a number of different solutions in front of us. And what we really just need to do as, a, as an industry is educate ourselves and just keep pushing for all of these solutions instead of, uh, instead of ignoring the problems or dwelling on them. And with that, I'm sorry to say it's time to wrap up this episode, but we don't wanna let you go until we've heard your dessert wine courses, everyone. Um, something special you've been enjoying lately, perhaps related to wine. Diana, did you have a dessert wine for us, a recommendation? Yes. When I get way too bummed out about the state of the planet, I have a lot of fun with some of these different Instagram accounts, which uh, are poking fun at the seriousness of the wine industry. <laughs> and the three that I follow now, and please let me know if I'm missing some, but the three that I'm really enjoying right now are at shitty wine memes. Oh yeah. And yeah, <laughs> so good at subculture sommelier and at cool wine kids only. Those get me laughing when I'm feeling desperately depressed. I don't know the other two. So that's great. I just uh, shitty wine frames, uh, creators, uh, uh, acquaintance of mine. And I, I, adm I admire what she's doing. So I want to find out about the other two. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. I think we all need that right now. Uh, how about you, Melissa? So I, don't really eat dessert. And when you posed that to me, I was like, hmm, well, I am kind of obsessed with cheese. Um, cheese is my dessert and something that I've been enjoying a lot lately that I am a huge advocate for is a, it's a cheese produced by a really small farm uh, up near where I am um, in upstate New York. And it's called Nettle Meadow. And they produce a cheese called Kunik, uh, K-U-N-I-K which is a mold ripened uh, goat and Jersey cow triple cream, which you will like die from. Um, it's ridiculously delicious. And not only do they produce delicious cheese, but it's also, uh, the farm is also an animal sanctuary. And we are huge animal lovers over here with cats and dogs and chickens and soon to be a hedgehog. And so, <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, my, my dessert course, uh, stinky cheese. <laughs> mm, love it. <laughs> How about you, Martin? You know, my course today is actually going to be a little bit of uh, binge watching on Netflix. I'm trying to be, you know, more consume vegetarian uh, food whenever possible. And one a title caught my eye, which was uh, The Bad Vegan. <laughs> it was about um, a restaurateur in New York. It's a fascinating story. And if you're into good real life drama of, uh, you know, how a darling of the almost celebrity r restaurateur in, in New York uh, had a massive fall from grace, ha having been found by, you know, according to, to the story where she was fleeing 
New York because she had embezzled a bunch of money with this uh, the scam artist who scammed her too. And then they were found because they ordered takeout pizza from Domino's in a seedy hotel somewhere in the middle of the country. That's a fantastic story that I, that I binged on. I knew about this story and went through a, through a phase of cleansing and stuff. And, but I didn't know that it's now on Netflix. I can't wait to watch that. Thanks. Well, I feel like my dessert wine is a little boring after that. With this warm weather, thinking back to a trip to Sardinia in April and the, the wine I fell in love with there, I know I, I should say I fell in love with the Cananao or the indigenous Cagnolari, but the wine I fell in love with in Sardinia was Vermentino. And I mean, total showstopper wines there. Um, not enough of them are imported. If you're able to get your hands on a really good vineyard designate Vermentino from Sardinia, holy cow, I, I'm just crazy for these wines. Um, the producer Mar Mario Bagella, I, I uh, visited in the Sorso area on the Gulf of Asinara. His, his Vermentino just blew me away. So that's the wine I'm drinking right now. With that, thank you so much to our guests. This has been an amazing conversation. So much to think about as we move forward. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Melissa. I just really appreciated hearing your perspectives on this subject. Thank you both. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much to our amazing panelists. You can find Melissa Saunders, Master of Wine, online at communalbrands.com, C-O-M-M-U-N-A-L, brands.com, and thegoodgoods.co. And you can find Diana Snowden Sess online at dujac.com, trien.com. I should probably spell those two. Probably. D-U-J-A-C -D is dujac. Trien is T-R-I-E-N-N-E-S. Snowdenvineyards.com, that should be easy enough to find, and AshesDiamonds.com. Excellent. And you can find me, Martin Reyes, at ReyesWineGroup.com and NapaThrives.org, Napa, T-H-R-I-V-E-S dot org. We are gunning for a gala. <laughs> Napa Thrives. Great cause. Great organization. Thank you. Thanks for, and, thanks for moderating, Catherine. That was oh, awesome. Oh, it was so much fun. So much Incredible. fun. Incredible. People came up to me like, who's Catherine? She's awesome. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's, I know her. She's my buddy. <laughs> I know the founder. Anyway, you can find me, Catherine Cole, at catherinecole.com, or even better, please find me at thefortop.org. And hey, listeners, please let us know, what do you think of the idea of a universal glass bottle? I'm in. Should we get rid of bottles altogether? Let us know your thoughts. Uh, please visit thefortop.org where you can find our social media handles and you can tweet at us or message us on Instagram. And please subscribe to The Four Top on your favorite podcast app. Leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts so that other, others can find us. Signing out here from the high-fiber protein-packed city of Portland, Oregon. And Martin, where are you? I always, I always sign out for myself. Where are you? It's okay. I've been waiting for this moment my whole life. I'm on, <laughs> I'm on stage of the sign out. Is it, this is my big moment. Yeah, where are Signing you? out from the small seaside village adjacent to Vallejo, halfway between Napa and San Francisco, probably also protein-packed village mm -hmm. of Benicia, California. Well, thanks for that. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye-bye. This has been the Four Top Podcast. Catherine Cole is our executive producer, Izzy Kramer is our senior producer, and I'm Keelan King, sound supervisor. We are also assisted by audio editor, Michelle Richards, our production assistant, Rachel Grossman, creative assistant, Lex Rule, and editorial assistant, Nick Toole. Please visit our website, thefortop.org, to learn more about us, listen to back episodes, reach out to us on social media, and purchase books written by our amazing panelists. And if you have not already subscribed to The Four Top on iTunes or Spotify, please do so and leave us a rating. Stay safe out there, and thanks for listening. <laughs>